For the past few years, Vitotis has gone on the offensive. He has now gone off to conquer Tataruthenia, where he has befriended a deposed Khan, one Toktamish. Together, he claims, they are going to conquer their way to the Black Sea. Part 5 of the Adviga campaign is Vitaurus' Crusade, which is essentially a giant side quest that takes up an entire scenario. Today, we will look at the design of what might be my favorite scenario from the campaign, and we'll also talk about how to use triggers, the coding language of Age of Empires 2. Welcome to Making Jadwiga. If a handcrafted map gives a scenario its face, triggers are what give it life. They can provide it with unique objectives, dialogues, cutscenes, and potentially complex gameplay mechanics. In short, triggers are what make a scenario tick. It would be a multi-hour series on its own just to go through all the trigger effects in detail, so today we will only cover the basics. Allow me to present 11 basic points of triggering. Number 1. A trigger is an if-then situation. Basically, this means that every trigger contains an if. If x happens, then the trigger does y. If x does not happen, then the trigger does nothing. For example, if Joan the Maid walks into this area, then the trigger removes her and this horse, and creates a Joan of Arc unit in that place. Number 2. Conditions. All the potential if situations in a trigger are called conditions. If a condition is met, then the trigger fires. There are lots of unique conditions, and all of them are customizable. With object in area, for example, you can check for any object belonging to a certain player in an area, even ones that the player creates while playing. If you want to check for a specific object, such as a hero, you can use bring object to area instead, where you can target a single unit already placed on the map. And if a trigger has no condition, it will fire immediately. Number 3. Effects. These are the things that happen once a condition is met. You can change an object's name or hit points, you can make a unit move with task object or patrol, research technologies for a player for free, and much, much more. Number 4. Starting conditions. One of the easiest things you can use triggers for is to create unique starting conditions for your scenario. Maybe you're making a multiplayer map for you and your friends, and you want each player to have a unique hero version of themselves. Or maybe you want each player to have a unique way of winning the game. All of this can be set up with just a handful of simple triggers. Number 5. Objectives. Any trigger you create can be set as an objective, and once its conditions have been met, it will be struck out. You can also choose whether an objective should appear only in the Objectives tab, or on the on-screen shorthand, or both. Number 6. Trigger settings. Triggers can be set as looping, meaning they repeat their effects as long as the conditions are met. They can also be set on and off. If a trigger is set to on, it will be active from the start, and if it's set to off, you will have to activate it with another trigger using the activate trigger effect. Number 7. Cutscenes. Now this could be a video on its own, but I'll try to keep it very brief. With triggers you can create cinematic sequences, and you can do so by using the change view effect to move the camera. By creating and removing map revealers, you can control what the player sees. With play sound, you can play music and sound effects, and with display instructions, you can show dialogue. Cutscenes can be used either to create little moments of storytelling in your scenario, or you can go all out and create entire cinematic scenarios with no gameplay at all. Number 8. Trigger Systems By chaining triggers together, you can create more advanced systems. These can be used in a myriad of ways, so let me just give one example. Let's say you want the player to receive reinforcements from time to time. In that case, you can create a system consisting of three triggers. One which is set to on and has a timer for 10 minutes which activates the other two triggers, which are both set to off. The second is a looping trigger which creates and tasks the reinforcements every few seconds. The final one deactivates the looping creation trigger once enough reinforcements have been created, and then activates trigger one again to make the chain repeat itself. Number 9. AI Trigger Interaction With triggers, you can change an AI's behavior, although that does require that you know how to make an AI to begin with, and that's a topic for a different video. You can use the AI script goal effect to send a message to your AI when a certain condition is met. 
In this example, the AI will attack as soon as this conquistador has been killed, and to make sure it doesn't keep attacking forever, the rule disables itself afterwards. You can also do it the other way around and have the AI send out signals, which can be detected with the AI signal condition. Number 10. Organize your triggers. Once you start adding dozens or even hundreds of triggers, it's very helpful to keep them organized. You can do so either by just naming them so you know what's in them, or you can take it a step further and split them into groups. You could have all the objective triggers in one place and a group for each section of the gameplay. Also, in my experience, the last group you add is going to be for the last minute bug fixes that you inevitably need to add. And number 11. Keep experimenting. Most triggers are pretty self-explanatory and they can be combined to produce countless gaming experiences. They're a bit like Legos in that way. You can use triggers to create anything from simple victory mechanics to grand story-driven epics, or advanced multiplayer scenarios like Castle Blood, which are essentially new game modes on their own. Now of course, you don't need hundreds of triggers to make a good scenario, but learning how these mechanics work will give you a lot more tools to play with. One of the challenges with the Jadwiga campaign was that Jadwiga just isn't your typical campaign protagonist. She's not a conqueror, and while her contributions were of great importance, they mainly consisted of diplomatic deals and internal programs, such as establishing schools and hospitals. Things like this are great material for side quests, and the goal of Scenario 2, Star of the Poles, was precisely to show Jadwiga's non-military contributions to her new kingdom. But it's much harder to build an entire campaign around them. That's why the Jadwiga campaign, in many ways, is a campaign not just about her, but about the founding of Poland-Lithuania. In that context, it made a lot of sense to include a scenario centered around Vytautas. This allowed us to show the trio of him, Jadwiga and Dragaila as important founders of the Union. It was also an opportunity to show the really interesting piece of history that is Vytautas' crusades in the East. The fact that Vytautas got soundly beaten by the Tartars' failed retreat tactic, and later used it to help win the Battle of Grunwald, was just too perfect an opportunity to miss. This is one of the largest maps in the campaign, and it sees you play a build and destroy across nearly every inch of it. After drawing up a rough map outline, I went to work designing the Polish town where you begin your crusade, as well as the land surrounding it. Next, I designed the first of the villagers you liberate. Originally, some of the villagers were supposed to be a bit less thrilled about your arrival, but unfortunately I had to trim that bit of dialogue. After this, I designed the main set piece of the scenario the Grand Fortress of Cassie Kerman. It's your most powerful enemy until the Golden Horde shows up, with double walls, fortified towers and a wander location that's only accessible by the river or by storming the place. The Golden Horde's camp is a bit of a cramped design, and that's intentional. It makes it more of a challenge to reach their wonder, and it directs the player away from the area used for the finale.
Kasikuma's economic base grew gradually over the course of the design, as I returned to it over and over. Ironically, I often find it hard to design these simple build and destroy friendly bases, because it's hard to craft them into specialized designs. So the easier the design should be, the longer it usually takes. The Crimean Tartar camp was a similar story, and it gradually came together over several days. After this I designed the open forest to the northwest, as well as the areas nearby. Here you can set up a defensive camp, in case you don't feel like building your base right on Kasikurma's doorstep. Next was the old Genoese fortress of Vodzia. Originally you were supposed to be able to choose between buying them out or killing them off. But because I was already using too many dialogues at this point, I had to simplify it. The ships you get here were also not planned at first. They were added during the process to give players a second option for destroying Kasikurma's wonder or taking out the Crimean Tartars. After this it was mostly a case of filling in the blanks, but because it was a big open build and destroy, those blanks were pretty large, so I had to design a whole bunch of nature. There were some changes made to this scenario compared to the initial script, which you may not expect. The final battle with the Golden Horde was originally supposed to be a defend the spot mission, where you would bring all your soldiers and lose control of your economy. You would receive a wagon fort by the Vorskla river, and have to defend it against multiple waves of attack, before being lured by the feigned retreat. This is closer to what happened historically, but it turned out to be rather tricky to get the transition from build and destroy to fixed force right. And because we already had a similar thing planned for the next scenario, we decided to turn the Golden Horde into a powerful post-imperial army instead. The enemy's building wonders was also not planned at first, and it came about as we were changing the gameplay flow to be even more build and destroy focused. When we made that change, the voiceover was already being recorded, and that's why there are no dialogues at all relating to the wonders. Vitalis' Crusade is a dynamic scenario, where you transition from one kind of gameplay to another multiple times, and your choices to some extent shape how your enemies react. It might be my personal favorite of the campaign, and I learned a lot while making it, which I will try to bring with me to future projects. Next time, we reach the end of the campaign in the fruits of her labor, where Yogaila and Vitalis face off against the Teutonic Order at the Battle of Grunwald. <laughs>